This is Francis Sedeco with Tirius Research. I'm here uh, at WC 2024 uh, with Jorg Weeking from, uh, from IBM. Uh, and we've been going through their Watson X uh, um, uh, platform. So Jorg's gonna kind of walk us through a little bit more about their .ai and dot governance parts of that platform and uh, kind of just give us a little bit more deep dive on exactly how these things work and how they're being used. So go ahead, Jorg. Yeah, thank you so much. So what I will show today is uh, the What's Next AI and What's Next Governance component of our What's Next platform. Our What's Next platform is basically our generative AI platform to, to make, so to enable enterprises to use generative AI and it also, uh, so it also enables so to, it's also for traditional machine learning, so to say, yeah. And what we can see here is already the dashboard of, of what's next AI. So we see the prompt lab here um, for interactive prompt engineering, yeah, to support prompt engineering for organizations. We see the tuning studio where we can uh, tune models for a specific task. We can see uh, the AI governance component where we, uh, where we can track models, where we can monitor models we can monitor use cases, AI use cases, and we can also see the Jupyter Notebook editor for specific tasks and for traditional machine learning. But these are just examples of, of this platform. So there are many more components. I will show today uh, the prompt lab here and especially the AI governance component. So what we see here is uh, already the, the prompt lab where we can yeah, iteratively develop uh, prompts for generative AI, and this is a structured form, so we can we can develop this 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 these prompts in a structured or in a free form, and in structured form we always have yeah one instruction that we want to give the large language model. So in this case we talk about an IT service desk agent, and we would just want to summarize um, the service request, the incoming service requests, yeah. We want to summarize them and extract the key information out of it. So we don't have to read the whole request, for example. And how we do that is just, we have an instruction here. We have two examples here of a service request and a summary. And then we can, with only these two examples, we already prime the underlying uh, generative AI model towards our context and, and uh, so to say, tell them how our output, intended output, should look like. And then we can already test the prompt here by um, using this example and generate the output here. So this is really yeah, just an interactive way how we can develop prompts before they, we save them and put them into, uh, into production and before, them, before we can deploy them. Yeah, so the deployment of prompt is also possible in what's next. So for those that maybe aren't as familiar with this aspect of developing uh, AI models. Mm -hmm. Can you tell a little bit about prompt engineering and what it's meant to do? Yeah, so when you think of traditional machine learning, traditional machine learning, for traditional machine learning, we have always, we have always had, uh, for one use case, we trained one specific model. Now with generative AI, we have foundation models. So a broad, a huge models that are there for many, that can be used for many specific use cases. And that's why we need now prompt engineering to, um, to yeah, use this huge foundation model to get it to make, uh, so to, 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 to act it in an intended way. And that's why we need to engineer these prompts. So prompts, as you, you, you can see them as an input in these foundation models, so that we can engineer this input to get to the intended output. Because so, we don't change the underlying model yeah. anymore. Yeah. So as, an app, as, a, as a model developer, yeah. you would do something like this because you're maybe anticipating the types of questions that your model is going to get and then you're trying to train the model to exactly to have the the, the, the response that's more contextually relevant and, and so forth yeah to have the response ready to, yeah. to know the response so for example if we a, a very common use case is retrieval augmented generation where we have a knowledge base we have a search we do a, a similarity search on a usually on a vector database, and then we put, for example, um, to, uh, 10 results of the search, we put it into the prompt and ask the large language model, hey, can you answer this question? And then we get one specific answer based on our knowledge base. Perfect. Yeah. And then, and what we can also do here and have a look at is 
our foundation model library. So our foundation model library supports a wide range of models to have always the specific model for the specific use case. So we always go for yeah, a targeted models here at IBM and that we can show uh, that we can always have yeah, a very targeted model for targeted use cases so that we can have smaller, faster models. Yeah, and this, uh, the, the models included here in What's Next AI are open source models, IBM models and third party models. And we can also filter here for specific use cases like retrieval augment generation, I just mentioned generation, uh, question answering and, and all, um, all these kinds of use cases, for example. And then we can also see the different provider we in integrate here in What's Next AI. Yeah. So if we are then fine with our um, with our prompt, and we would like to deploy it, we can do that in What's Next AI and deploy the prompt and create an API references uh, API reference so that we can directly integrate it in our systems in our products. And what we can also do then. And what's important, if we want to use it in production, we need to govern this process. Yeah. So, uh, and for governance, we now switch to what's next AI governance. So that's all integrated in this platform. Yeah, and we can see that here. So we can see here again, our use case of service request summarization. And we can see here then in what's next governance, that you can track the whole life cycle of this use case. So we can see what happened in development, how we developed the prompt. We can see uh, what happened in validation and how it performed. And then we can see in operation the deployment. So how does it perform now in operation? And we can add uh, additional approaches here. So this is the first approach to solve this use case. We can also have a look at the second approach, which is here still in development. But let's go back to the first approach. We can see here that it was perfectly performing in development, it was perfectly performing in validation, but we have a, a problem here in the deployment. So we can see here that we might have a problem in deployment because the, our monitoring component says something is wrong here. So let's have a deep dive here. And I go directly into the deployment space here of this prompt. And here we see now our AI fact sheet. So in the AI fact sheet, we document everything regarding this use case. So from development, validation, operation, all that kinds of uh, information. And also for the traditional machine learning, the data we use for training and all that. So that's all in the AI fact sheet. And we can see here, again, the whole life cycle development, validate, operate. We can see that it's tracked, so this been um, so this use case is monitored in production. Everything inputs output are monitored here. We can see the foundation model we used. We can see again the prompt template. We can use the prompt parameters. That we can all adjust in uh, in the prompt lab. So we can also yeah see the code of the prompt lab and all of that. But we could take hours here, <laughs> and we can now see in. In the evaluation part, the, the different evaluations in development, validate, and operate. And we can see in this example um, that we had a test in development, we had no alerts, and we can see that all our generative AI quality measures are within the thresholds. So one typical example is hate, hate abuse profanity, so that we don't have any out, that we don't have any hate speech in our output. So we can see that here. Other typical examples are personalized identify information so that we don't have any, in the worst case, client data in our output. And this is measuring the output, right? Yeah, so yeah. this is measuring the output as well as the input. So here we can see the same for the input and also the same here for the input for personal identify information. And we can see here typical um, typical quality criteria for summarization use cases. So in our simple use case, we talk about summarization. So we have a Rouge score here. So text similarity. Who, who determines the passing threshold? Is that something that you as the developer have some target goals and can set? Or is there like an industry standard or so how, that's, how is that? 
that's all completely configurable. So okay. of course we can do that here on a use case level, but we also see companies that want to enforce some thresholds on a company level. Yeah. And we can we can do that with uh, with with workflows where we can really set quality criteria here. And so that's that's all configurable here, and we can also see the model health. So. Uh, how many tokens we used, what was the latency and all of that. So that's all the test of the development here. The same we can see here in validation. So that also in validation, in our use case here, the model performed well. And now we go down to deployment. And here in deployment, we suddenly have three alerts. So we can see that something went wrong here in this example. And we can see, we can also directly see what's the problem we see that the input metadata drifted. So we're using this use case, this Gentify use case with different input data uh, compared to what we have developed it for. Yeah? We can see input metadata drift out of boundaries here, out of the threshold. And we can also see the same for the output metadata as a result. So what was the difference between this phase versus when you were first developing it and it passed, and it passed those, those criteria? We can see so in development and validation, we use test data. We use test data to prove that the model performs well. And now we are in deployment. So this is monitoring data. So this is live data, so to say, where, where we now see how it's, how it's performing in deployment, in production. So even though we did prompt engineering before, the yeah. prompt that's in, 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 in the live version could be any prompt, right? Because it was something that, that, exactly. that the you know, the user put in themselves. And that's why you have a potentially different output. Exactly. So the model didn't change, but obviously the model was used with different data here. Mm. So the user may, might put in different data than uh, compared to what is trained on. And as a result, we can also see that the readability of the output dropped here, dropped below our threshold of 60. And so, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. We can now go one step further into the monitoring component and see how that developed over time. And then, so how does the the whoever is um, responsible for this model? How do they take this data and then do corrective action then to try to resolve this? So uh, what what we would probably then had is is like something like an incident management, so that we see already okay it's it dropped out of boundaries here, and then there would it it would uh, trigger a process for example in organizations that uh, somebody would say hey. Uh, we need to we need to uh, take care of this model because it's some or this generative AI use case because it's performing in a different way. So and then how would you normal? What are the levers uh, available to try to fix this? Is it do you do further prompt engineering? Do you have to maybe change the model? Like what what do you do to try to fix it? So what we usually would do here is is yeah, for for example we could do further prompt engineering. So first of all create a second approach in this use case what I just showed, like there was a second approach still in development. So this could be prompt engineering and this could also be fine tuning so that we can fine tune a model more specific to this use case. And first of all, I would check, check if the input data is, is still this use case or the model is used somewhere else or this use case is used somewhere else. Yeah, and we can now go one step further into the deployment and have a look at the monitoring component so that we can see um, how the model performed over time here and when this drift happened. Yeah? So for example, in this example here, we can see that the drift happened somewhere around last week and it's getting a little bit worse here. So we can see the input metadata drift and output metadata drift and it's, uh, it's out of the boundaries here. And we can also drill down here. So for example, input metadata, simple things like sentence count. So the sentence count is completely different than it was trained on, yeah? so that it was developed for. And again, we can see here in the monitoring component how it developed over time. So this was quite flat. But for example, average word uh, uh, length was also getting a little bit different. Um, so it was, was changing during the uh, during the deployment so in in the live uh, environment yeah and we can see the same uh, in the generative ai quality for example for the readability so we can see here that the readability dropped below our level of 60 so 
readability of the output, basically. So this is measured by a small language model that um, yeah, basically analyzes the readability of the output. But we can also see that the um, personalized identify, personally identify information and hate abuse profanity was still zero. So that's all good, but we have a problem with readability and drift in this example. And is, um, is, is, are all these tools able to be used on models that are um, non-English? Because uh, obviously English language is, is part, is part mm -hmm. of it, but what about for other models that are maybe um, non-English based? Yeah, so um, of course uh, a lot of in the large language space was English first, but we also have a model in the platform that supports different languages like German, Spanish and, and all of these, yeah. yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Great. And then, um, so in terms of, uh, of availability, if somebody wanted to, mm -hmm. you know, they see this video, they wanted to, that sounds like exactly what I need. How do yeah. they go about working with IBM to, to access these tools? So first of all, in, in the IBM cloud, um, so these tools can be, of course, used in the IBM cloud, but also used uh, on-prem. Um, but in the IBM cloud, you can uh, you you can have access with the cloud account to a couple of tokens, so they can really already start uh, and and prompt engineer and and try out a little bit of things. And there are always ways to contact us. Perfect. Yeah. Great. Thank you.